Sermon 5, a continuation of the entry from February 5th, 1916. When the following night came, the dead approached noisily, pushing and shoving. They were scoffing and exclaimed, Teach us, fool, about the church and holy community. This begins Sermon 5. The world of the gods is made manifest in spirituality and sexuality. The heavenly ones appear in spirituality, the earthly in sexuality. Spirituality conceives and embraces. It is womanlike and therefore we call it Mater Coalescis, the heavenly mother. Sexuality engenders and creates. It is manlike and therefore we call it Phallus, the earthly father. As we know in the world of creation, everything is dual. Jung brings forth a new pair of opposites, namely sexuality and spirituality. Opposites, in which Jung said in a 1925 seminar, are a pair that need each other. And as we continue to look into the essence of these two, we will see how their relationship together is inevitable. Before going into their opposing yet united nature, we must first look at what Jung means by man and woman-like. Jung is speaking on the essence of masculinity and femininity, hence the earthly father and heavenly mother. And this is not specifically biological gender, but this is, one can say, energy or personality. To expand on this idea, I'll bring forth an image widely known from ancient Chinese philosophy, the yin-yang symbol. The yin side of the symbol represents reception or the feminine aspect Jung is speaking on, whereas the yang side represents generation, the masculine aspect. We will see this theme continue to show up throughout the sermon, but it's important to remember at this point that there are opposing energies that manifest in all of us. And from this symbol, you could see how the whole of it represents the gods, which Jung spoke on in the last sermon say, Eros, whereas yin and yang represent the manifestations of the gods. Now, spirituality, again, is one with the yin side, a receptive aspect. Symbolically, Jung names it Mater Coelestis, or the Heavenly Mother, to capture the feminine energy and heavenly or eternal realm. On the other side, sexuality or that yang side, represents the creative aspect. Symbolically, Jung names it the phallus, or earthly father, to capture the masculine energy, and earthly or creative realm. Now on these symbols Jung presents us, I want to provide a few quotes from his collected works. First, an important quote on the function of the symbol from his transformations and symbols of the libido. Symbols are not signs or allegories for something known. They seek rather to express something that is little known or completely unknown. We take mythological symbols much too concretely and are puzzled at every turn by the endless contradictions of myths. But we always forget that it is the unconscious creative force which wraps itself in images. So it is an energy or psychic phenomena in which these symbols are pointing to. While we can comprehend thoughts and emotions, they're invisible. And it is just this invisible world which Jung is attempting to outline throughout the seven sermons. The first symbol to explore, signifying sexuality or the creative masculine energy, is the phallus. A footnote in this sermon reads, In transformations and symbols of the libido, Jung noted... The phallus is a creature that moves without limbs, sees without eyes, and knows the future, and as the symbolic representation of ubiquitous creative power, it claims immortality. Continuing on this phallus symbolism from a lecture titled The Practical Use of Dream Analysis, the phallus always means the creative mana, the power of healing and fertility, whose equivalents in mythology and in dreams are the bull, the ass, the pomegranate, the yoni, the he-goat, the lightning, the horse's hoof, 
the dance, the magical cohabitation in the furrow, and the menstrual fluid, to mention only a few of the thousand other analogies. That which underlies all the analogies and sexuality itself is an archetypal image whose characteristic is hard to define, but whose nearest psychological equivalent is perhaps the primitive mana symbol. For those curious, Jung writes, the phallic symbol does not denote the sexual organ, but the libido, and however clearly it appears as such, it does not mean itself, but is always a symbol of the libido. So we see the term libido showing up here as it did in the previous sermon. But as we remember, the gods manifest in sexuality and spirituality. Just as one end of the libido is sexuality, the other is spirituality. While the phallus or sexuality fertilizes, it is spirituality or the mother who is to be fertilized. On the spiritual symbolism of the mater coelestis or heavenly mother, we start with a footnote found in the Red Book. The Mater Coalescis should on no account be thought of as Mary or the Church. She is rather Aphrodite Urania, as in St. Augustine, or Pico di Marandola, the Beatissima Mater. Continuing on the spiritual symbolism, I found a similar reference in Plato's Symposium to the Aphrodite Urania of St. Augustine. Plato wrote, and am I not right in asserting that there are two goddesses, the elder one having no mother, who is called the heavenly Aphrodite? She is the daughter of Uranus. The younger, who is the daughter of Zeus and Dion, we call her common. And the love, who is her fellow worker, is rightly named common, as the other love is called heavenly. In this quote, one can sense the distinction Jung is attempting to get across with the symbolism of the Heavenly Mother. Now continuing, I found a quote in Pico di Mirandola's Oration on the Dignity of Men. He wrote, Natural philosophy will at best point out the way to theology and even accompany us along the path, while theology, seeing us from afar hastening to draw close to her, will call out, Come to me, you who are spent in labor, and I will restore you. Come to me, and I will give you the peace that the world and nature cannot give. Summoned in such consoling tones and invited with such kindness, we shall fly on winged feet to embrace that most blessed mother and there enjoy the peace we have longed for, that most holy peace, that indivisible union that seamless friendship through which all souls will not only be at one in that one mind, which is above every mind, but in a manner which passes expression, will really be one in the most profound depths of being. Now through this quote, one could see another analogy that relates sexuality and spirituality. The natural philosophy, one may notice in the beginning of the quote, can be one with sexuality, whereas theology is one with this spiritual heavenly mother. In addition, you get a great feel for this embracing essence of this feminine spiritual energy. So while there are various ways sexuality and spirituality show up, we are beginning to grasp the wholeness of their essence. To add one more point on this pair before continuing, one can see the earthly father as consciousness or differentiation and the heavenly mother as the unconscious or oneness. Jung continues on the spirituality and sexuality of man and woman. The sexuality of man is more earthly. The sexuality of woman is more spiritual. The spirituality of man is more heavenly. It moves towards the greater. The spirituality of woman is more earthly. It moves towards the smaller. Mendicious and devilish is the spirituality of man that moves towards the smaller, as is the spirituality of woman that moves towards the greater. Each shall go to its own place. Man and woman become devils to each other if they do not separate their spiritual ways. 
For the essence of creation is differentiation. The sexuality of man goes towards the earthly. The sexuality of woman goes towards the spiritual. Man and woman become devils to each other if they do not distinguish their sexuality. Man shall know the smaller, woman the greater. So while the energy of masculinity and femininity are in all of us manifesting spiritually and sexually, Jung is now speaking on the biological aspect of our nature. Just as there is a yin and yang to produce a symbol of consciousness, it requires a man and a woman to produce life. It takes, one can say, the phallus and womb to produce a child. In this reflection, we see an opposing essence biologically as man and woman. This is not to say a man is only masculine and woman is feminine, as again they have both energies in them. But there is a tendency, according to Jung, that each opposing biological entity follows. If the yang or yin decides to be what they wish to be, rather than what they are, there is no wholeness to life. The balance is off. And in this case, if the yang decides to be a yin or the yin decides to be a yang, you can see how the ego, rather tyrannical ego, has mucked up its own unfoldment or development and is not allowing consciousness to truly be what it is. Now on this tendency, Jung separates man and woman. In sexuality, man's essence is more earthly and woman's more heavenly. Again, sexuality is the manifestation of a creative engendering in mana energy. So this creative energy in man should naturally manifest more earthly, somatic, visible, and material. Whereas in woman, it should naturally manifest more heavenly, mental, invisible, and immaterial. In spirituality, man's essence is more heavenly and woman's more earthly. Spirituality, again, is the manifestation of an embracing, receptive, and conceiving energy. So this embracing energy in man should naturally manifest more heavenly, mental, invisible, and immaterial. Whereas in woman, it naturally manifests more earthly, somatic, visible, and material. The key to focus on here is wholeness. Man and woman, one will notice... And standing true to their essence will allow spirituality and sexuality to be as they are. And in addition, it allows both the above and below, or earth and heaven, to be bound. To further expand on these ideas, I'll provide a few examples. If one is only embracing the higher in spirituality and sexuality, then they will be airy, inflated, and lack grounding hence lacking wholeness. This can be represented as a lost soul. On the other hand, if one is only sexually and spiritually attached to the earth, there will be a lack of the higher, of the divine, of spiritual nourishment. This can be represented as a sick soul. In all, we see how Jung is keeping all in their own place in essence, allowing nature to run its course. Now, this is a difficult teaching to contemplate for many in a society promoting an awful idea of identification with an ideology, a gender, a this or a that. What I say to that is the only true identification there is, is with self, which unfolds according to it and not you. You won't continue on the essence of spirituality and sexuality. Man shall differentiate himself both from spirituality and sexuality. He shall call spirituality mother and set her between heaven and earth. He shall call sexuality phallus and set him between himself and earth. For the mother and the phallus are superhuman diamonds that reveal the world of the gods. They affect us more than the gods since they are closely inclined to our essence. The mother is the grail. The phallus is the spear. Here, Jung is providing a key to the idea of differentiation, as he's placing each symbol or essence accordingly. Spirituality is placed between heaven and earth, say the subconscious, whereas sexuality is placed between oneself and the earth, 
say consciousness. In addition, there's an important point that is snuck into this section that I want to dive into. That being the idea that the manifestations of the gods affect us more than the gods as they are closer to our essence. To draw an image, we can see how Jung is setting up a hierarchy of enfoldment. From the one come the gods or archetypes from the last lecture, the monads. They then manifest through the dual ends of the libido as sexuality and spirituality. It is then the soul and then ego that achieves consciousness or awareness. So you can see through this how our essence is closer to the energies of spirituality and sexuality than the monads in which they are created out of. To conclude this section, Jung then adds two more symbols on top of the symbols which he's already provided. And these symbols, I believe, relate to the idea of oneness and differentiation. The grail is a container of all parts of the whole, whereas the spear separates the whole into parts. Without parts, one cannot know the whole. Without the whole, there is no parts. Additionally, the idea of intelligence or logos can be one with the spear, whereas love or eros can be one with the grail. And on a side note for anyone interested in the depths of the symbolism, Wagner's Percival grasps the spear and grail as they both play a leading role in this myth. Jung continues the sermon as he has more to say about the importance of differentiating oneself. If you do not differentiate yourself from sexuality or from spirituality and do not regard them as things in themselves, you are delivered over to them as qualities of the pleroma. Spirituality and sexuality are not your qualities, not things you possess in a compass. Rather, they possess and encompass you, since they are powerful diamonds, manifestations of the gods, and hence reach beyond you, existing in themselves. No man has a spirituality or a sexuality unto himself. Instead, he stands under the law of spirituality and sexuality. Therefore, no one escapes these diamonds. You shall look at them as diamonds and as a common task and danger, a common burden that life has laid upon you. Thus, life, too, is for you a common task and danger, as are the gods, and first and foremost, terrible Abraxas. The first point to highlight is an important one. And it's easy to overlook it. For something to exist in itself, this means it has its own intelligence, its own specific pattern and essence that makes it unique. We remember this idea coming forth in the first sermon as it corresponds directly to Platonic thought. We remember the quote where Parmenides taught a young Socrates, yet on the one hand, as it fails to the ability of an individual of a very good natural disposition, to be able to learn that there is a certain genius of each idea and that of self lucia according to in and of self. Now this is a significant point to ponder when grasping the nature of differentiation. To use a biological example, one can say your liver functions on its own terms, with its own specific intelligence and functions different than, say, the heart. Now, if you take this psychologically, there are certain invisible forces which have their own intelligence and function that are unfolding in us. Now, to truly get to this thing in itself, allow it to be itself and see it functioning in itself intelligently, it requires a true meditation, a true self-reflection without any prior programming from beliefs or opinions. A meditation to allow the things in themselves to be. This is the process of differentiating oneself. Seeing it is more than you, an ego, in you. I do want to add the notion of meditation is popular today. Or I'd say individuals believing they're meditating by spending a few minutes a day to allow the mind to be calm, comfortable, but the truth about a meditation is it's rather a lifestyle. It requires a discipline to develop. And for those familiar with Jung's Red Book, 
or the Red Book series I produce, you can see why Jung began his journey in the solitude of the desert, as all the comforts and attachments must be left behind in order to truly earn reality. And to drive this point home, I found a beautiful quote to bring it all together. Every advance in culture is, psychologically, an extension of consciousness, a coming to consciousness that can take place only through discrimination. Therefore, an advance always begins with individuation. That is to say, with the individual, conscious of his isolation, cutting a new path through the other two untrodden territory. To do this, he must first return to the fundamental facts of his own being, irrespective of all authority and tradition, and allow himself to become conscious of his distinctiveness. If he succeeds in giving collective validity to his widening consciousness, he creates a tension of opposites that provides the stimulation which culture needs for its further progress. So the only way for us to advance as a society is individuals taking the step to allow it to be. Now, after this reoccurring Greek addition to the sermons and a reflection on allowing consciousness to be, we join Jung back in Sermon 5. Man is weak and community is therefore indispensable. If your community is not under the sign of the mother, it is under the sign of the phallus. Absence of community is suffering and sickness. Community in everything is dismemberment and disillusion. The essence of your being is differentiation. But because of man's weakness with regard to the gods and diamonds and their invisible law, community is necessary. Therefore, community, as much as possible, not for man's sake, but because of the gods. The gods drive you to community. Insofar as the gods impose community upon you, it is necessary. More is bad. Now with all this talk about differentiating oneself in individuation, Jung brings forth an interesting term, community. How can there be a community when you're individuating, when you're becoming one yourself? And in addition, many that do leave society to gather their self, to introvert, struggle to find community. Now on this dynamic of struggling to get back and readjust it into society, there's a footnote that refers to two different presentations Jung presented to the psychological club concerning the relation of individuation and collectivity. They are titled Adaptation and Individuation and Collectivity and are found in Collective Work 18 for anyone interested. Now at the end, Jung says more is bad and because the gods impose community on us, it is necessary. To this... He adds two different ends if one has too much community or no community at all and the repercussions of each. I'll begin with community as our times are plagued by individuals unable to bear their self. Jung says community in everything is dismemberment and dissolution. In this, the individual becomes scattered among the many. One loses one's sense of oneself and becomes a mass man or woman. This is the exact opposite of what the dark form from the East told Jung in the previous sermon. That is, to be a one among the many. Now, if one denies any community and is rather in singleness, in solitude, Jung says that there is sickness and suffering. Community, however little it may be, if it is the right, healthy community, provides the individual a connection to humanity and the earth. It also is a place where commonality is found, hence providing encouragement and love to man's weaknesses. But as we will come to see, as the sermon comes to its conclusion, community is not a place to take from, nor a place to be dependent on. One concludes Sermon 5, In the community, every man shall submit to others. In singleness, every man shall place himself above the other. In community, abstention. In singleness, extravagance. Community is depth. Singleness is height. 
Right measure in community purifies and preserves. In singleness, purifies and increases. Because the community gives us warmth, singleness gives us light. In community, we go to the source, which is the mother. In singleness, we go to the future, which is the engendering phallus. Jung concludes the sermon with the idea of singleness and community. And you can see how they're related to the idea of spirituality and sexuality, or the mother and father. As Jung says, in singleness, we go to the future, which is the engendering phallus. And in community, we go to the source, which is the mother. One who is individuating, bearing oneself with discipline and allowing it to be, will see the others in oneself. And when they go to community, they won't need to rule, take, or kill another. Because in this kind of community, all there is is love. And while in singleness, it is extravagance one can chase after, it is in community where the opposite is sought. Rather, one goes humbly into the community without a need to rule. And finally, I want to connect the ideas of spirituality and sexuality, community and singleness, and love and knowledge. One could say on one hand, that spirituality, community, and love are all of a similar celestial essence of eternity. Whereas on the other hand, sexuality, singleness, and knowledge or light are of a similar earthly essence of creation. Now at this point, the red and black books conclude in two different manners. The black book never concludes as the entry continues into Sermon 6. In the red book, though, as after every sermon the dead left Philemon and Jung, muttering, laughing, or mocking them, they did not leave and wanted more. The red book conclusion reads... When Philemon had finished, the dead remained silent and did not move, but looked at Philemon with expectation. So with this expectation, I'll conclude Sermon 5. While there's no post-sermon Red Book discussion, we find after Sermon 6 a lengthy discussion between Jung and Philemon, which will make up for any lack of post-sermon depth. Speaking on Sermon 6... The dead remain silent, and Jung continues to teach about the diamonds of spirituality and sexuality, more symbolisms in the serpent and white bird, and the idea of the essence of thought-desire and desire-thought. Until then, stay humble.